before we do, I think I'd like to uh, just do this for you guys. Some traditional cock rock poses. <laughs> of poserdom, the hurricane of reformed hipsters that comprise the Canadian retro metal scene in 2016, Razor is the real shit. Speed metal with a thrash edge, thrash with searing speed, the most savage, merciless metal you can conceivably locate while retaining the rock and roll roots of the motorhead monolith the band unrepentantly worship at the altar of in the process. Canada's finest export by far, and a prime contender indeed for my favorite thrash band of all time. And only nine records this may wind up on the shorter side of the mythos, but it's a journey any true metalhead must take regardless. We're kicking it up from zero to thrash, so strap the fuck in for some razor. You guys recorded Armed and Dangerous right at that point, and then it's just more like self finance at that point. Yeah. Uh, people would buy records based on, first of all, they'd go into stores just to see what something looks like. That's right? why People records. did that, right? They'd go, okay, I'm looking for something new. cool. So we thought, okay, let's put together something that looks like a metal guy will want to pick it up. Right, we made an EP because we knew that wouldn't cost too much. It was only like back in those days, it was like five ninety eight to do that. So we figured people would take a chance on us for that money, right? More so it worked. Much. It yeah. worked, right? We made it, called it Arm and Dangerous with heavy song titles. The titles of the songs were meant to have any like fast and loud, hot and metal, yeah. uh, you know, like the, the titles of people, oh yeah, shit, I'll try this. It's like... Spurred to the front lines of the burgeoning Canadian speed metal scene by the pounding pontifications of the almighty Motorhead and NWOBHM pioneers Raven, a fast and loose trio at that time devoid of a singer formed from the ass-kicking ether, consisting of bassist Mike Campagnolo, drummer Mike Embro, and longtime band leader and guitarist extraordinaire Dave Carlo. Because apparently when petitioning for membership in Razor, it is a legal but fucking requirement that you have a last name ending in the letter fucking O. They had the songs, they had the irreverence, Fuck, they even had the album cover. What they didn't have was a singer. Enter a wide-eyed young mop top by the name of Stace McLaren, soon to be christened for all eternity as Sheepdog, presumably in tacit tribute to his Looney Tunes doppelganger. The youngest member of the band by far, and to hear him tell it not remotely inspired by the same kind of music at a glance, his addition to a gaggle of unrepentant headbangers would seem across purpose. And then that motherfucker cast wide as yap and screamed his ever-loving nads off. Take this Danny Filth, you should be paying fucking royalties. But enough of that preening piss-take princess, because right from word go, it was abundantly clear that Razor were for real. And with uncharacteristically high production value for what is ostensibly a fucking demo, not to mention seven slices of sonic savagery that have weathered the permutations of the eternally evolving extreme metal landscape to emerge as all-time classics, 1984's Armed and Dangerous was emphatic proof of precisely goddamn that. Best track... Well, there's not a dud in the fucking firing chamber here, folks, but for myself, the clear standout is the title track. Topping out at over five minutes by thrash metal standards, that qualifies as a motherfucking epic. <laughs> Dangerous, firing freshman salvos of speed metal might as if they'd been doing it all their goddamn lives without missing a beat. With Razor officially on the scene, the Great White North classed their dicks and lady bits in unison and braced for badass. Well, over blowing your fucking minds apart tonight. Ha ha ha. 
Got another one. It's about sleazy ladies. You have the right to remain burned. Along with an unerring commitment to quality that would thankfully characterize every Razor offering from literally the beginning to the conclusion of their all-too-brief output, one of the band's other habitually recurring themes was present virtually from the very outset as well. This one to their eternal detriment. Meddlesome motherfucking record companies with newfound label Attic Records yes, the very same Canadian brain trust that ensured metal goddess Lee Aaron's career would remain embedded in the side of a cliff face smack dab in the center of the fucking Yukon in perpetuity physically incapable of leaving well the fuck alone and all but completed full length album entitled Escape the Fire was unceremoniously shit canned when impressed by the unqualified success of Armed and Dangerous Haddock moronically demanded that material from the EP in question be featured on the forthcoming full length. In the process, shedding some of the strongest tracks from what would later be bootlegged to Bogota and back as the Escape the Fire demos. While Superb was a glorified early years compilation, featuring a small handful of new tunes to fill out the remainder of the record, the vast majority of which showcase a more polished, rock-oriented songwriting style that became emblematic of prototypical Razor, a sound that owes more to Saxon than Slayer, and one which would sadly fall by the wayside of the band's relentless pursuit of top-shelf aggression going forward. Production? What fucking production? We had made another recording that was supposed to be our first full-length album. It's called Escape the Fire. Mm -hmm. We did that in December of 84. But what happened was um, Attic Records, the label that signed us, because Armin Dangerous sold so well, they insisted that some of Armin Dangerous had to be on the first album they put out. I hate the mix on that because they, they just made everything, like all this reverb, and it's really big. And for that kind of music, you don't want it to be tight. Yeah, and they yeah. didn't do that. They yeah. made the opposite. So like the drums are just way... Way too, uh, reverberating. I know! Let's piston fuck the living shit out of the mix with an unremitting daisy chain of dick! I've heard more bass in a fucking dog whistle, asshole! Which is apropos because if this album had any more treble or reverb, that's the only audience that could actually fucking hear it! Not that it's any skin off my nuts, after all, my favorite band is Bathory! Man, his first four records I have every reason to believe were recorded on a Walkman, in a shoebox, in another fucking shoebox, in a blast furnace! In short, it's thrash! Blow me! Worst track? While it's not unlistenable, I will say the version of The End, from its glacial pace to the sub-sub-subpar production shot job to the fact that some leaning tower of twat at Attic Records decided to put an intro track at the end of the fucking album is irrefutably fucking inferior to its more atmospheric, armed and dangerous counterpart. Executioner's song, scuttled by executive incompetence, and as a result, not quite as good as its predecessor, but it wouldn't take Razor long to abandon ship and re-emerge with the battleship fucking Potemkin of 80s thrash records. The fist-throttling faithful could do little but brace themselves for an invasion. Thrash metal murder was committed in the year of Art Lemmy 1985, my friends, in the first Fucking degree, an album possessing all the aggression of top shelf thrash with a melodic, catchy, black tar smack addictive edge few of its contemporaries can conceivably boast. Evil Invaders is what happens when Priest fucks Motorhead with Exciter providing the lube. From the ominous, muffled riff craft at the outset of instrumental opener Nowhere Fast, Razor Second Siege brazenly lifts the finger at the concept of a sophomore slump and leaves it the fuck erect. Perhaps nowhere more emphatically than the second track and the first song in the album with actual fucking words in it, the eternal classic Cross Me Fool. Cross the fool, I'll be score, what you get, 
from the title track to the song that was supplanted as the title track thanks to some frankly well-advised record company interference, Thrash Dance. Again, Attic Records uh, chose the song for the video and they chose the title of the album too. At the time, we wanted to call the album either Speed Merchants, which is another song on the album, or uh, Thrash Dance. We, we, we liked either of those two titles. Is great to outright excellent. Perhaps the album's greatest defining feature, however, is how much faster it is than its predecessors, which for a band who sacrifices a goat at the altar of Motorhead on a nightly basis is goddamn saying something. Previous offerings were more than expeditious affairs, but some of the material on Evil Invaders arguably pioneered the subgenre that would ultimately be referred to as Power Thrash. <laughs> aggression with a twist of melody, Evil Invaders is one of the most important records in two separate genres, but whether you call it thrash or speed metal, I call it a tits out triumph that finds shockingly frequent rotation on my turntable and car stereo. Get. That. Shit. <laughs> Depending on what Razor fan you ask, Malicious Intent will either be the perfect complement to its groundbreaking predecessor, or a needlessly polished bit of pomp and pussery cranked out to placate a feckless record company and a clueless lead singer. The original lineup of Razor, you see, had more problems than an algebra textbook. We'll get to that in greater detail a bit later, but the bottom line? It wasn't so much oil and water as oil and fire, with vocalist Sheepdog endeavoring to push the band toward a more anthemic commercial sound in hopes of hitting it big, and guitarist Dave Carlo convinced the Megadeth method had some merit. The result was Malicious Intent, an album like the grindstone emblazoned on its cover, whose sole purpose appeared to be smoothing the jagged edges of an otherwise unpolished thrash metal marriage. And as in the case of records like Forbidden's twisted into form, or Metallica's Master of Puppets, the result was a more coherent, purposeful assertion of the band's heretofore unbridled Blitzkrieg. Carlo's incendiary chugcraft has never been clearer in the mix. Sheepdog's ethereal screams acquired a much-needed veneer of marketability. Fuck, even the bass is goddamn audible on this record. Over time, I dare say malicious intent has risen to the status of being my odds-on fuck-you favorite in the ceaseless kick-ass clinic that is the Razor catalog. With the aforementioned fuck you directed square between the wall eyes of the crusty battle jacket brigade over at metalarchives.com production i know right i can hear the articulation in the guitars without pressing a fucking conch shell to my ears for once what a great goddamn tragedy not enough screams what are you fucking high actually i take that back if i had to wade through the virginal morass of sophistry and suck ass that is metalarchives.com on a daily basis i'd probably be free base and rubber cement too not enough screams mother Fucker, this album opens and goddamn closes with one. Turn it up! Louder! Louder! Case closed, Captain Cuntface. This album shreds ass for free, twice on weekends. Next! Set your phasers to pretense, with three quarters of the band, helmed by guitarist and founder Dave Carlo, endeavoring to redefine sonic aggression, and their talented but somewhat oblivious young frontman laboring beneath the delusion that Razor would catapult him to superstardom, Sheepdog dug the fuck in and refused to budge when it came time for their sixth. The net result is an album more considered, melodic, and dare I say fucking progressive than anything cranked out by the Kaisers of Kanekistan before or since, none of which is a deal 
breaker for me. Look, variety is the spice of life, and after seasoning the preceding five releases with the wall of sound approached by the untrammeled fucking ton, you might even argue a bit of variegation was outright called for by this point. And then you actually slide the record from the sleeve, and one immutable truth smacks you flush in the face like the ropey crank of a young Tommy Lee onto the T-zone of an improbably tan Pamela Anderson. Razor, do not write technical thrash for good fucking reason. Sheep dog, I love you, buddy, but this is an ass pounding imperative. You, my friend, must never fucking ever sing another note with what you construe to be a clean voice. Again, It's not that the songwriting is aimless so much as Razor appear to confuse progressive, with removing the song break, smashing three unrelated tracks together like a set of alien tits in Total Recall, and trying to pass off the resultant incongruous seven-minute tri-dick musical Hydra as one song, compounded ever further by a turbo-botched production job that may well be the one thing thinner than Steve Shive's skin. You crank the treble any higher, your slick, you'll liquefy our goddamn organs. Hank Hill has more bottom end. Custom killing. Not unlistenable, unless of course you happen to be Daredevil, but the first true stumble of the storied band's career. The time was right to rebound, and sweet Jesus did they ever. There's a lot of anger coming, coming from me when I wrote that album, because I was pissed off about uh, the reception that Custom Killing got, and I was, uh, you know, I was uh, a lot of um, interviews or reviews of the record um, I guess I read one that really pissed me off, and I still remember it. It was this guy named Don Kay, and he wrote for Kerrang! or something, and he said that I had lost the ability to write songs. With Sheepdog's prog metal pissing match yielding by far the worst record of the band's career, guitarist and founder Dave Carlos seized the reins once more in an effort to realign the band with its former repute. A few issues with how the production was done and the performance on those albums. Malicious Intent and Custom Killing, yeah. although Custom Killing was more experimental. Right. But, um, you know, then we moved to the next album. When I did Violent Restitution, I just took total control. On the blindingly bright side, from this crucible of creative differences, emerged arguably the finest single thrash metal album of the 1980s. A defining moment in the extreme metal milieu, slathered from top to titties in chainsaw fucking fretwork, and piercing ethereal screams from the soon-to-depart sheepdog McLaren. Frustrated with Dave Carlo's refusal to employ management and the band's resultant lack of success... Uh, Dave, what are you doing for management now? Well, we're still self-managed. <clears throat> We've had offers over the years. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was we were having a hard time finding anybody we were looking. We've been on a constant search. Now we've had offers in the last couple of years, especially on this tour, we got offers. The bottom line is we asked ourselves this question. Is there anybody out there who can do any better a job with the band than we've done ourselves? And at this point, we don't think so. McLaren agreed to record, but not promote, the album in question. Though if VHS footage from the period is any indication, he was ultimately roped into doing at least a few shows in support of Violent Restitution. And featuring easily the finest production job of the band's career, McLaren's voice was never more venomous. Adam Carlo's bass never more ballsy. Newcomer Rob Mills' percussive assault hits like a fucking howitzer. And Dave Carlo's heavy metal thunder has never been quite so booming as on this one glorious moment in thrash metal history, next to Motorhead's criminally underrated Sacrifice album, perhaps Forbidden's Immortal Twisted into Form as well. Sis, your locks run out, the thread has snapped, they call depressing air. This is, in my eyes, the thrash genre's finest hour. And did I mention it's dedicated to Charles fucking Bronson? Because Violent Restitution is dedicated to Charles Bronson, bitch. And with 14 and one half tracks of unbridled 80s vengeance, you can see fucking why. Perhaps nowhere better codified than in the ode to comeuppance that is out of the game. Violent 
Restitution is the unofficial soundtrack to Death Wish 3. Perhaps best of all, much of the aforementioned backstage acrimony appears to have snaked its way into the album's actual lyrical content, as primary songwriter Dave Carlo seems to be taking shots at the very vocalist who is singing the words to his fucking song. <laughs> Asking Razor for subtlety is like asking Charlie Sheen for a clean blood test. It simply isn't done, folks. And fuck subtlety anyways, because this album is the absolute apex of its respective genre. Chuck it on. Twist the volume knob further to the right than Rand Paul and forget that fucker exists, because it is physically impossible to blast this record loudly enough. And thanks to Relap Records, it's been remastered, it's in print, so buy that shit! Much music have had a copy of our new video, Shotgun Justice, for over a month, and they will not play it because they think Razor is too violent a band, our lyrics are too violent, we talk about guns too often, and I guess they figure we're racists too, even though we've never sung a song that had anything to do with racism in it. So they won't play our video, we just think they're picking on us. So we want to send them a petition with as many names as we can get. Tell them all to fuck off. Exit Sheepdog, enter Bob Reed. By the 90s, you see, the musical, social, fuck, even geographical differences within the Canadian powerhouse had reared their ugly forehead. Sorting through all the he said, she said, yeah, huh, nah, uh, you suck with your mouth, juvie jerk that is the backstage politics within Razor for even a vestige of objective fact is a bit like looking for a wedding ring in five feet of raw sewage. Sure, it's down there, but... How much do you really love this woman? And I can honestly see both sides of the two-faced coin. Dave Carlo is absolutely correct. Custom killing is bullshit with a side of weak sauce. And yes, Stace McLaren's fingerprints are all the fuck over that bitch. But one album doesn't mean you hold a fucking memorial service for a band's entire butt-fucking career. Otherwise, Metallica would have been selling blood to pay the light bill since, oh, 1990 fucking one or so. What does, however, put a stake through the sternum of a fledgling thrash band is a consistent refusal to engage third party intermediaries to manage your fucking band, particularly when you're working the night shift at Photo Barn and twiddle your testes Ontario to pay the freight, and repeatedly refusing to relocate to the states where thrash bands were making out like robber barons for their mere act of touring consistently in a nation that actually gives a fuck, all the while writing songs blaming American fans for your righteous case of mercantile dysfunction. What's the problem with the USA? Well, it's simply this. Any old basement band can get together and it doesn't matter if they haven't played their instruments for more than a week. They can go to New York or they can go to LA and they can get recognized and get some stupid fucking recording deal because they sprayed their hair and styled it properly because they wore the right kind of clothes and that is the whole criteria for them to be a bunch of fucking uh, so-called musicians. And only in America can that kind of bullshit happen. Now it happens in Canada, but to a lesser degree because Canadians have this tendency to be just a little more intelligent where these matters are concerned. Wah! We're from Canada! Other bands are more popular than we are! Wah! What do you mean hire a manager and tour the States? Fuck you! Wah! It's like this song invented the entitled, whiny, poserific posturing of every Johnny-come-lately Canadian retro metalhead furiously wasting our oxygen in 2016. You never heard Motorhead or Wasp complain about the fact that Metallica was 50,000 times more successful than they were? I mean, fucking Poison moved from Pennsylvania to make their fortune on the Sunset Strip. You mean to tell me the biggest set of swinging dicks in all of Canadian thrash don't have a pair of nads between them so they can fuck off to Frisco? Have you ever really gave a lot of thought to moving south of the border? Um, we thought about it maybe uh, two or three times seriously over the last eight years and uh, came to the same conclusion every time. Uh, 
it's the, the competition is tough in Canada. It's also tough in the U.S. I repeat, in terms of commitment to their craft, Poison had a bigger dick than you. Grow a cock, Canada. Socialist sob fest notwithstanding, the call shotgun justice merely a killer record is to do an immeasurable disservice. Initially afforded a somewhat mixed reception, in the intervening years, shotgun justice has proven to be one of the truly titanic statements on offer from the thrash genre of the 1990s. Which, considering the quality of its early 90s contemporaries, is nothing to break wind at whatsoever. Just listen to this titty fucking title track! Not an overcoat, you quiz the most of us to hate! Sit like in the ceiling, forgot to close your eyes! The cell's got men dies! Shotgun justice? A dud? Fucking blow me. Bob Reed may not be sheepdog, but he also isn't trying to be, and he fit the band like a glove in his absence regardless. This record has also received the relapse remaster treatment, and I can't recommend it highly enough. Not quite violent restitution, but only by a cunt hair. Next! Uh, the new album is already written, and it's uh, very much uh, the kind of album that a guy who bought Shotgun Justice is going to like, and the guy who bought Violent Restitution is going <clears> to like. It, it, it's really heavy and the songs are still in the uh, you know two to three minute range for the most part and there's a lot of songs but uh, lyrically we're trying to inject a lot of humor into our lyrics now and that would be the biggest change I think is that we're, we're trying to put a strong sense of humor across on the new album and still try to say some relevant things while we're at it you know, that's kind of why we're, we're loosening up the lyrics a bit on the next album we're just trying to avoid people thinking we're actually a bunch of Charles Bronson vigilante maniacs <laughs> Listen to the thrash metal mastery of Razor and thought to yourself, sure, the head banging riff craft is all well and good, but what this needs is political preening by the numbers power thrash riffs and more drum machines than Varg's basement? Then have I got the album for you! After a sterling freshman barrage, the good news was that the reincarnation of Razor hit the ground running just one year later. The bad news was that they lost drummer Rob Mill's phone number in the process. Sans percussionist, the Ontario Triumvirate's only recourse was to resort to the dreaded drum machine. And at first glance, the results aren't completely unlistenable. As any first wave black metal fan will happily inform you myself, foremost among them, good songs withstand the rigors of subpar production, and fuck if this album isn't precisely fucking that. From the opening glass break to the closing air raid siren, open hostility, whatever its peccadillos of production, is among the most unjustly overlooked releases of 90s thrash. <laughs> A misguided experiment? Now the Frankenstein monster was a misguided experiment. Slapping C-3PO behind the drum kit in a band that prides itself on an organic sound and has derided other bands of the past for the very same? It seems like uh, in the U.S. there's that movement where even garbage will sell just because it does. There's yeah. enough people out in the United States yeah. that you're going to find some fans somewhere. Was the goat fuck of the epoch. But the material is as strong as ever, if a hair on the samey side. The band's already tenuous momentum withering and commercial prospects decidedly on the wane. Just one year later, Razor called it a career. Or did they? The year is 1997. Music is dead, buried, and via Napster well on its way to being passed around like a narc in a prison shower. Grunge came, it saw, it blew its talentless fucking head off its shoulders, when suddenly, without warning, from beneath the brine and bullshit, a wash in a sea of khaki cargo pants, like a demon from the deep! Came Decibels, the comeback record no one knew about and far too few asked for. To date, Decibels remains one of the lone exceptions to the give up and down tune ethos of 90s metal. Hey, thanks for that, Slayer. The final result is exceptional within the context of its time frame, but increasingly banal with the benefit of hindsight, with more than a few throwaway tracks sprinkled like a Japanese gentleman's seed onto the face of a willing hentai skank in between. Favorite track? 
fun. Beyond the musical merit of the song in question, it's refreshing as a B-12 blowjob to have a band of Canadians, no less, eulogize the ineffectual nature and unintended side effects of worthless gun control, particularly during the protracted PC piss take that was the 90s. Between the eyes. Sadly, even apart from a fair few instances of filler, it's not all sunshine and jasmine-scented flatulence in the land of Razor, cause bitch, it's the late 90s, and you know what that means, ladies, gentlemen, disgendered pansexual species fluid single-celled organisms, it's high time for the CB radio megaphone fuck the 90s carbon Trent Reznor perma-flanging vocal effect. <laughs> Fuck, 90s, that is the edgiest thing to hit junior high school since Pogs. On the subsequent tour for which an attempt was reputedly made to bring original vocalist Stace McLaren back into the fold, an overture that was greeted with the most resounding of fuck yous. And honestly, as much as I'd love to hear the original Razor lineup thrash the planet together once more from the diaphragm, his response that it's not his album, so he's not about to go out and promote it? Terse to be sure, but not entirely invalid. Look, if you want the fucker back in the band, cut a record, have him tour, and bring his ass back in the band. None of this half-measured, pushy footing the fuck around. I mean, at this point, what do Razor have to lose? The quadrennial festival gigs they do for five days out of the ass fucking year? Somehow I'm downing this band as Dave Carlo's meal ticket. Yet it seems every few years, like clockwork, the reunion rumor mill revolves anew, and such remains the case in 2016, with the band announcing a new record due in 2017, presumably featuring long-suffering frontman Bob Reed, the result of that aspect may be a foregone fucking conclusion at this point. That does it, folks. Whatever the band's status, Razor's place in the ethereal mists of the metal mythos is motherfucking assured. I'm Razor Fist. God. Fucking speed. <laughs>